it's a pleasure to be here, and, um, and I'll, uh, I'm not going to. I'm going to break all the conventions of what happens at these conferences, right? Because I, I've never been to this conference before. But I've been to a bunch of other marketing conferences, and um, generally speaking, I find them pretty boring. To be quite honest, with you. I find the speeches a little bit boring, personally. So nothing against the people who are speaking here today. I'm sure it's going to be brilliant, but you know how it goes with these things, right? They, you stand up, you play some slides, you play some videos show some pictures, and the theme of all these talks, again, not here, but at marketing conferences in general, <laughs> no disrespect to this conference, uh, but the theme of these things is quite often exactly the same, right? The, 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 the message is always the same, which is this. You'll know what it is, right? Irrespective of what brand it is that's talking, the theme of the talk is this. I am absolutely brilliant. And the company I work for is absolutely brilliant. And all the people I work for are fantastic. And we do amazing creative work. And if you just listen to me, you could be brilliant too. Right? Isn't that the theme of how these things go? Um, which is why most people are you know, updating their Facebook uh, status most of the time when, they're, when they should be listening. So um, that's how it goes for me anyway. Just, just my, that's just me personally. Um, so I'm not going to present any slides. Uh, I have two slides. This is one of them. Um, you, can, you can show the next slide if you want. Do you want to see so there's no suspense? That's the next slide. All right, go back one. Go back one. There you go. First slide. Now I know where I am in the presentation. Because um, <laughs> I've got a timer, you know, I've got to keep this on track. Um, so, uh, no slides. I'm not going to talk about Old Navy. And this is the scary part. You might want to close the doors at this point. Uh, I'm not going to do all the talking. I'm actually going to ask you to actually get involved. So. Uh, I can sense the fear rippling down people at the back, like trying to run for the exit. You can't run. They're, they're going to lock the doors. Um, so yeah, that's what's going to happen. We're going to uh, have a conversation on this, um, on this theme. So, so let me get into it. I, I do have this. I'm going to use this. Um, so uh, the three brands that I've worked, I've worked on a few brands, but there were three that sort of came to mind when we started talking about it. One was Volkswagen um, Beetle. I worked for Volkswagen in the late 90s, and it was when we were bringing back Beetle, and that is a brand or object, a thing uh, that has an intensely loyal following. You know, people were rabid about the introduction or reintroduction of that car, so that was interesting. Uh, I worked for Coca-Cola for five years, was the global creative director there, and um, probably most of you are thinking, you know, that's not really a cult brand. I would agree, actually. I don't, think it, I don't even know what a cult brand is. Maybe you, can, maybe you could explain it. Uh, or someone could explain it, I'm not exactly sure, but it does have an intensely loyal following. The interesting thing about Coke is people make their minds up. You're either a Coke or a Pepsi person, right? Very, very unusual to be ambivalent, right? People normally are one or the other. And you make your mind up when you're in single digits. It's a bit like politics, you know? You, you inherit it from your parents, whatever's in the fridge, and you don't ever change your mind, really. No one ever knows. They, people don't change their minds. So you make your mind up when you're, you know, seven, eight years old, and then you never change. So. Um, by that measure, you know, it's hard to think of another brand, actually, that has that tenure of sort of lo loyalty through, through the lifetime of a customer. So that's Coca-Cola. And then lastly was Converse. You know, I worked at Converse for a couple of years running marketing there at, uh, internationally. And that is, um, I think that really is, if I was still at Converse, I'd definitely be upstairs in the ballroom, wouldn't be down here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, seriously, I'm happy to be down in the basement. I've spent a lot of my life down in basements. Um, uh, Converse is definitely a countercultural band, and, and, and you can tell when you put on an event with Converse, and we put on a lot of events. In fact, all, everything we did was events, basically. When you put on events, people show up, not because you pay them to show up, they just want to show up, and they don't go home. <laughs> they won't leave at the end of it. So again, all three brands, I think, have um, a, a, a intensely loyal following, a sort of a loyal um, group of people that like to follow them around. And I think that's really what it's all about, isn't it? A cult brand is about having a loyalty, having like a following, having a group of people who are advocates, disciples, whatever you want to call them, you know, that will, that will follow you around and, and, and pay you, basically. Um, so, you know, I was thinking, well, what, what do those three brands have in common? It's not their size. It's not the category they operate in. It's not their price on the, 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 where they sit on the value chain, you know, how much you pay for them. It's, they've really got nothing in common. So I would conclude from that that any brand, irrespective of what sector you're in or what price you charge, has the ability to have an intensely loyal following, 
I would say, based on that. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, I'll use my flip chart now. Okay, so I have a confession to make at this point. I don't like marketing. I don't, um, stu I don't like the science, the discipline of marketing. I studied at university and dropped out. I thought it was really boring. Um, but I remember one thing, I remember this. You've, you've all seen this before. This is how you build a brand, right? Um, it could be an onion or a, a circle or um, I think it's probably, this is probably the most common one because they're really easy to draw on, a, on this type of chart. But um, this is how most brands would think about it, right? You've got down here, you've got USP or like, you know, what makes you unique in the world, what makes you different. It's your, for Coca-Cola, it was the secret formula locked in a vault in Atlanta. Not true, uh, by the way. Um, you know, something that makes you unique and different. And in, in, increasingly, it's very hard to stand out you know, to have a USP because they get copied really quickly. And it's just not really, you know, again, just to go back to the three examples, it's not true for Volkswagen, it wasn't true for Coke, and it's not true for Converse. I mean, I've been to the factories in Converse, I know how they make those things. It's a lump of rubber, they stamp it onto a sole, they vulcanize it, and then they sew a canvas top on the top. It's exactly the same as Vans, it's exactly the same as all the other sneakers that get made, actually, and vulcanized, all the same. Uh, 7-Up, uh, Diet Pepsi, Pepsi Max, Coke Max. People can't tell the difference. Cigarettes, alcohol, blind test it. They can't tell the difference. They really can't. They think they can, but they can't. So it's increasingly difficult, almost impossible, to have a real unique selling point that can't be copied by someone else. Um, and up here, let's call this purpose. This is, I think, like maybe in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, this has been the maybe the theme of a lot of marketing, you know, Tom's and brands like that, that, you know, how you, it doesn't matter what you sell, it matters what you stand for, it matters what you believe in in the world, it's all about your belief system, so it's like, it's either this, it's either what you sell, which is unique, or it's your purpose, you know, it's what you stand for in the world, which makes, which is why people buy you, people, brands are like ideological parties, and you follow them, like you follow a, you know, a, an ideology, and that's why people buy brands. I'm not saying you can't build a brand based on a point of differentiation, and I can't, I'm not saying you can't build a brand built based on purpose. I'm just saying it's not true in my, in my experience for the three brands that I've worked on. It's not true. That's not, I don't think any of those three brands really are purpose-driven brands. Coca-Cola would maybe like to think they are because they sort of promote happiness, et cetera, but it's not true. I mean, it's not, it's not what customers would actually say. And... As I said, there is no real point of difference. I mean, they make the same, Volkswagens are made on the same beds as Audi, uh, and they use a lot of the same components. So there's really a lot of similarities. So the very, very clever people in the audience will have worked out by now that I think there's something in this middle sector, and uh, which, which, which is you know, why I think most brands, actually, certainly the three that I've worked on, have this intensely loyal following. It's got something to do with that middle sector. And uh, I couldn't have paid for a better set of speakers, actually, to the keynote and the Cirque du Soleil fella who was just talking upstairs. Couldn't have paid for a better set of speakers to tee up what I wanted to talk about here, which is this middle section. And it's, it's, I guess in its simplest terms, what I'm talking about is emotions, right? And this is, I only have one point to make, actually. This is it. So if you're checking your Facebook, just pay attention for the next 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, this is it. It's the emotional connections that a brand makes. It's the emotional memories. It's the emotional triggers that you, uh, that you spark that last the longest and that go the deepest, right? It's not the rational ones. Purpose is an ideology. This is your frontal cortex. These, these two, this is rational benefits and this is an ideology. This is your frontal cortex working, right? In evolutionary terms, very, very recent. This is the front part of your brain processing. This is the part of your brain that thinks, when is this speech going to end? Why, how do I get a Starbucks? Why is there no snow on the mountain? That's your frontal cortex. Um, <laughs> your amygdala is the emotional processing part of your brain, which is a little bit further back. That's processing all your senses. It's like the processing unit that your smell and your sense and your hearing, your taste, those are coming in and they're being translated into emotions. That's the amygdala, a completely different part of the brain, like a separate processing unit. That's the part of the brain that brands who have an intensely loyal following, that's the part of the brain. Cirque du Soleil is a great example, actually. That's the part of the brain that, that these brands activate. Um, so uh, 
that's enough of me talking. I'm now going to, uh, you really should lock the doors because people are going to want to run away at this point. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you. If you're not sitting next to someone, it's a bit like kindergarten, if you're not sitting next to someone, maybe just go and sit next to someone. It's a little awkward. It's not going to take long. You're going to talk to each other for 60 seconds. It's really easy. You open your mouth and words come out. It's what happened before we all had, uh, you know, iPhone 6s. Um, it's quite easy. Um, what I want you to do is think about a thing, an object. Um, I'd rather not think about a person. Um, think about an, uh, you can think about a brand if you want. It could be a service, could be a hotel like this one. Could be your wedding ring, could be a bike, could be an app that you love, could be a, a, something that you have a strong emotional connection with. Okay? So think about a, a, an object, a thing, an experience, um, uh, that you have an intensely strong emotional connection with, meaning that if it disappeared, if it was taken away from you, you would get upset. You wouldn't just be mildly inconvenienced, you'd be upset. And it's, you don't just like it, you love it, right? Does everyone have a thing in their mind? Okay, find the person next to you. If you can't find someone next to you, go find, so sit next to someone and tell them, you've got 60 seconds, tell them what it is and tell them why you feel strongly about it. Tell me what it was that they were talking about and why they had like an intense connection with it. This is Miriam, and uh, she has an intense connection with her eyebrow lady. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, she's, she's nice. a pretty great, artist. eh? So she literally like would would like not move neighborhoods. She's had the opportunity to move before, but she decided to stay put so she could be close to her eyebrow lady. <laughs> Have you considered offering uh, to pay her to move with you? <laughs> <laughs> she has excellent eyebrows, by the way. Just anyone else? Can we just keep this going? Yeah. Hello. All right. Um, so I'll be talking here about Sonia. Uh, she, her. F so the she has this ring that she has on her hand right now, and it means a lot to her because it kind of. Uh, so the last time she went on a vacation back to Italy uh, with her family, she bought this ring, and uh, it kind of uh, reminds her of this moment uh, and the time spent with her family, and it, it's kind of the most valuable kind of like accessory or ju jewelry piece she has, and uh, it reminds her of her like uh, culture, family, and background. So yeah, this means a lot to her. <laughs> I want, to, I want you to try and boil it down to one or two words. Can you do that? Maybe three. Okay. One sentence if you can't. Can you try and summarize what it was that how he felt about that thing in one, two, or three words? Sure. Adjectives. <laughs> it was a commemorative, meaningful gift. Anyone else want to give a last go? Yep. I think it's pretty summed up when she said she'd just die without it. Anyone else? An eyebrow lady. Yeah. I'm the eyebrow lady. Um, so I'm sitting next to Chris, and he told me uh, the most valuable possession he owns is his rusty bike. And even though it's super rusty, he loves it because he can take it to work and no one's going to steal it because it's so bad. <laughs> but um, yeah, he kept going on and on about how he loves his bike. So that's his most prized possession. I'm going to try and bring this home now to apply that to brands that maybe you work on. So think about, think about being unique. Um, maybe you work on a brand that doesn't have a secret formula. Maybe you work on a brand that is you know, not completely unique. Um, there are, um, let me give an example of this. You know, Converse is a good example, right? It makes 40, $30 sneakers, not unique. You can buy them anywhere. They're ripped off all over the world. You can buy copycat versions in any store in the world. So how do you, how do you on a brand like Converse, how do you make it unique? Well, at Converse, what we do is we do collaborations, we do collections, we do special events. You know, we create uniqueness out of something that didn't previously exist. At Old Navy, we do it through 
making things only available for a short amount of time, right? This Saturday only, between 9 and 1 o'clock in the morning is when you can get that sweater at this price. So that's unique. You know, it creates this um, uh, only now can you get it at, for that thing. So it draws a line, basically. And this idea of familiarity is also interesting. So the rusty bike um, story. <coughs> um, we're drawn to things, emotionally, I mean, we're drawn to things that are familiar to us, which is fine if you're a 125-year-old company like Coca-Cola or, you know, if you have a lot of heritage, but what if you're a startup? What if you're a new company? What if you're a product that, you know, doesn't have a lot of familiarity? How do you do that? Well, that's where, I think, anyway, that's where archetype comes in, archetypal stories come in. You know, you, as a brand, you should know what your archetypal story is, and you should constantly tell it. I'll give an example. I never worked on this brand, but Vice. Vice is an interesting company. It reminds me of... Um, you know, uh, Virgin back in the day, you know, because they can transfer. It can be a skateboarding magazine one minute, and the next minute it's a lifestyle uh, company, and the next minute it's a news uh, company. But they're always vice. They're always doing it from that same point of view because they're a, it, they're a, they're a troublemaker. They're a, they're a rebel without a cause. They're an instigator. Like They just like to get into places where other people don't want to go and ask difficult questions and 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 mess shit up, you know, like that's what they do. So knowing what your archetypal story is is how you achieve familiarity even if you're a, even if you're a new brand. Um, personal. Uh, the wedding ring. <coughs> or the, the uh, I can't remember what the object was now, but you thought it was personal then you told it to someone else and they were like, oh yeah, I also feel that same way about it. So um, personalization. Think about how do you, you know, why, how do you personalize the experience, whatever brand you're working on, how do you make that brand, product, service, experience, how do you make it more personal? You know, I think, uh, I mean, the obvious examples are, you know, people like, you know, Spotify or Pandora or Amazon, you know, I mean, those are like kind of obvious ones, but uh, Macy's do a good job of this as well. I mean, this is the, this is the big buzzword, isn't it? Marketing personalization, you know, how do you, how do you make it so that every time someone comes back to you, you know a little bit more about them so that the experience becomes more and more personal? So that at the end of it, you feel like I, I, they get me. They get me more than anyone else. Goldman Sachs, they do a good job of that as well. Um, and then there's the, I don't know how to put this last one, but um, I was going to say design, but maybe it's just beauty. Maybe that's not the right word. Maybe it's just good design. But... Um, we're attracted to things that have um, an aesthetic quality to them, right? That, that have a, and when, it's interesting, maybe design's a better word than beauty, but um, when people think of design, they tend to think of, you know, colors and graphics. Um, that's what they think of when they think of design. I, I was in um, Tokyo last week, and we stayed at this hotel, and everyone was doing, and it's a new hotel, everyone was doing and arguing about it, because it was, it was beautiful, it really was, it was an amazing hotel. Um, but um, <laughs> it was extremely difficult to find your room because the elevator lobby had one set of elevators that went down, another set that went up, but they only went up to a certain level, and then you had to transfer. So people were wandering around all the time, couldn't find the way up to their rooms. So it's actually just a really badly designed hotel, even though it looked beautiful. And that's how I think of design. You know, I, I, does anyone know the designer Bruce Mao? Awesome designer. He he has this quote uh, where he says, you know, it's not about the world of design; it's about the design of the world. So design is not just making something that is aesthetically beautiful. Design is about knowing what problem you're trying to solve. You know, like in a hotel, for example, getting me from the lobby to my room would be one problem that would be good to solve. So. Um, Think about those things as it relates to your own brand or product or service or experience that you're creating. Think about, like, how do you create uniqueness? You know, do you limit supply uh, of whatever it is that you're selling? Do you um, jack the prices up so that only a few people can afford to get in? Do you do a collection with someone or a collaboration with someone in small quantities? Do you limit the availability or restrict the time that something's available in order to create this covetability? That's what uniqueness is about. That's how you drive that, like, I've got to have it. Um, familiarity, I mean, if you don't know what your archetypal story is, then there's plenty of people who I'm sure could, you could consult on that, but you should. 
because it's important to know what it is and to keep telling it. Uh, you know, we're attracted to brands and companies that tell the same story over and over again. That's why brands like, you know, uh, Virgin and Vice do so well. Personal, you should be learning more about your customer. Every time they come back to you, you should know something about them that they didn't know previously. And you should be tweaking and tailoring the experience to them so that it gets better and better every time they come back. Um, and that that's going to make them feel like they just get me like nobody else. And then let's call this one design. Um, design is like, what's the problem that you're solving in the world? You know, like, what are you, what are you, what are you here to try and do? What are the pain points that your customer experiences that you're trying to solve for? You know, so I'll probably wrap up at that. Those are the four points that I think you should, that you should think about. Um, I'll leave you with my final slide. Let's have it. It's a good one. Um, I, I did this presentation in the way that I did it um, uh, because I think this is how brands uh, should actually uh, engage with their audiences. I think this is how, how, how the conversation should happen. Um, don't talk about yourself because it's not that interesting. It's really not. They're, not. they're just not that interested. So don't talk about yourself. Have a point of view on something that's happening in the world. Have a point of view on the world that you live in. That doesn't mean having a point of view about yourself. That's easy. Have a point of view on the world. And then open the conversation. Have a, have a, have a dialogue. Those are the three kind of cardinal rules as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm.